After sailing across the ocean, settlers in the New World encountered something else that is vast and awesome, the American prairie. Illinois is known as the prairie state, but in one place, man had another plan for the acres teeming with unique life, a plan that turned deadly. With our senses cluttered by modern innovation, we may miss the colors. We may not take the time to explore the shadows, the diverse light flying through flowers and crawling through fields, not to mention the bison. This is the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie, an hour south of Chicago near Joliet. Medewin is a Native American word that means healing, a reference to its backstory for the prairie and for the people who live near here, like Armeline McCauley. I'm finding now that when I mention it, people don't know much about it. That's why it's important for her to keep the story alive. When man is introduced to nature, the forces that bring life can also bring catastrophic death. Illinois is the prairie state, but there's very little prairie left. We don't know what this looked like 200 years ago. There are no photographs, of course, but we do have a clue, a journal from a young woman named Eliza Steele who was traveling by stagecoach. That journal is a book called A Summer Journey in the West. Veronica Hinky is with the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie. She was amazed by the splendor of it. I started with surprise and delight. I was in the midst of a prairie. Her companion woke her up so she wouldn't miss the splendor of the prairie at the height of July in its peak in all of its colorful glory. We rode thus through a perfect wilderness of sweets, sending forth perfume and animated with myriads of glittering birds and butterflies. By the time Eliza Steele passes through the prairie, farmers arrive and some of the delicate prairie starts to disappear under the plow. But it's still a good 40 miles from factories, gambling dens, and stockyards in the big city. There's just life, not silent, but serene. A hundred years after Eliza Steele notes the prairie's beauty in her journal, tragedy strikes June 5th, 1942 at 2.45 a.m. There was a huge explosion. Boom. Boom! During World War II, the government buys land from the farmers and then 18,000 workers build roads, rail lines, and construct 1,500 buildings to help manufacture ammunition. It's called the Joliet Arsenal. The explosion kills 48 people inside a bunker. This is the wedding photo of my grandfather and grandmother. We return to a bunker with Armeline McCauley and her son, Keith. Armeline's father-in-law, Keith's grandfather, is an inspector at the bunker when it explodes. Many of the bunkers are still here. The first time I came, it made the story all that more real. Um, to see the actual buildings that uh, my grandfather may have been in. So the first time was very traumatic, more than we ever expected. The cause of death was disintegration by explosion, and that's on the death certificate. All that was recovered was fingers. In this photo, my grandfather is wearing the ring on his left hand on his wedding day. They're able to identify Lawrence McCauley's remains because they discover his ring still on the finger. Remains that were buried were the fingers in a child's casket. Oh yes, that he remembered well. Armeline's husband, Keith's dad, Dwayne, is just nine at the time his father is killed. My husband can remember the funeral 
vividly. They only had, of course, a, a picture of him at the uh, funeral home, Clancy's funeral home in Kankakee. There's the ring in the picture. And after several decades, the family still has it. We know that it was his ring because it, it shows on the photo of his wedding picture, uh, his hand very clearly with, with the ring. The ruby was reset in a bigger ring so Lawrence McCauley's son Dwayne could wear it. He passed away a few years ago. This is all we have of my grandfather is the memory and the ring. Joe Wheeler is an archaeologist with the U.S. Forest Service. They plan to keep some of these bunkers as a reminder of the important work that happens here during the war. It still stores equipment that was once used to transport munitions. This sign we found has all this stuff abandoned within the arsenal we got here. And uh, this one, I think there's a certain, uh, certain poignancy to it, even though we think of this big industrial kind of faceless endeavor. It was in fact full of people who had family members that were serving in the Second World War and uh, they really felt an investment that the work they were doing mattered. As an archaeologist, he finds the graffiti interesting. Everything from math problems to poetry. So we're not just interested in the artifacts, the things. There's also, uh, we're interested in what the things tell you about the people. A really nice depiction of a woman dressed in 1940s attire, kind of a Veronica Lake, haircut swept down in the back, and uh, maybe our best actual artwork. A way to pass time, vent about life, or perhaps a distraction from the idea that one wrong move could be deadly. The munitions uh, that were stored within the bunkers would be put on the conveyor and it would slide directly into here. So what happens that night? Despite uh, a thorough army investigation and a lot of uh, speculation over the years, they don't really know exactly what happened. During the course of loading anti-tank mines on the rail cars, while they were being packed in, an explosion happened in the loading dock of load assemble and package plant number two. It was a boom and a rumble, and about a second or two later, there was a huge explosion, so kind of a ba-boom, boom, type thing. Sabotage? An accident? It was just like I got hit with something, and that piqued my interest, and hopefully... Bernie Lavati was eager for answers. My grandparents were totally affected. Um... This is a family photo. Bernie's uncle Frank is the oldest, so he stays home. Bernie's father, John, serves in the military, along with brothers Joe and Al. None of them were ever injured, <laughs> got scratched. Nothing, but Frank's the one that stayed home and he's the one that passed away. And that's what's pretty ironic about it. Frank is a foreman at the plant that explodes. He was at ground zero when it happened. The shocks were heard in Joliet and one of the neighbors came to my grandparents and said there's been an explosion and Frank's passed away. It's a prominent chapter of the family story but it does not discourage Bernie from taking a job here as a teenager during Vietnam. When you started, they put you through orientation and they gave us a tour. And it was the 25th anniversary of the explosion and I was standing on the spot where the explosion happened. And it just, like a wave just hit me. And I go, this kind of solidifies the family history. So that piqued my interest in finding out what happened. What did the family receive in terms of compensation? Was there a finding of wrongdoing? Was it just an accident? What was the conclusion of all this for the, for the yeah, family? Yeah, that I don't actually know what the findings were, but the family received $5,000. The best theory I've heard was uh, the pallets did not fit the freight car exactly. So they used to hammer wedges so they wouldn't shake when they were transporting them. Supposedly this, they had wooden mallet and that he missed the wedge and hit the landmine. Uh, 
As a memorial to the workers killed in the arsenal, the community raises money to cast a bronze statue by an artist in London. But it disappears. The statue was uh, placed and dedicated, and not long thereafter, the statue was stolen. The community raises money again for another memorial. Then someone finds the original statue in a field. It now stands in the town of Elwood. The new one is nearby, outside the Abraham Lincoln National Cemetery. Outside of it because those killed are not veterans. Loved ones plan to move it closer to the bunkers. So that more people can view it and appreciate what really these people sacrificed. It's part of the, where the statue commenced is they were civilians and but they paid the ultimate price. Manufacture of TNT ends in 1976 and the arsenal finally closes in 1980. Then something strange. Amidst the cement bunkers, steel rail lines, and traces of ammunition, scientists find something unexpected, traces of life. Species of birds and plants they don't expect in the wake of this military industrial complex. A grassroots effort leads to a preservation act declaring Medewin a national prairie in 1996. What does that tell you about nature? It's pretty resilient. <laughs> It is incredibly resilient. Bison are brought here to eat the tall grass so the pastures become more hospitable for birds, insects, and other small animals. As more flowers rise, the bunkers slowly come down. The rail lines removed. Visitors come to hear the backstory of the arsenal explosion and experience the rebirth of a prairie restored to Eliza Steele's vision 150 years ago. A world of grass and flowers stretched around me, rising and falling in gentle undulations as if an enchanter had struck the ocean swell and it was at rest forever. A modern American may drive by and say, there's nothing here. The simplicity masks a complex ecology, one that is not prone to cement and steel. But where people disrupt nature, they can sometimes restore it. That's the mission of Medewin, a Native American word that means healing, the healing of nature, both our environment and our conscience. Coming up on Backstory, a marketing stunt that took over a Midwestern town decades ago and amazing shots from a groundbreaking photographer.